I'm Rita Owenby Holcomb, and the name of my book is A Twist of Tobacco, the first in a series. A family is like a twist of tobacco, layered, folded, and twisted until each leaf becomes inseparable. Ten-year-old Lizzie proudly watches her brothers, uncles, and close neighbors ride off to war in their butternut uniforms, not realizing that she will soon be responsible for her five younger siblings. Based on family stories and traditions and backed by years of research, this historical novel immerses you in the war-torn hills of Middle Tennessee, the bloodbath that was Chickamauga, and the hellhole of Rock Island Prison. Follow the Civil War lives of the 11 Ornby children during the Civil War and watch for subsequent books in the series. Book Lovers Unite! I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with Chapter One. And each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. Today, I'm speaking with Rita Onby Holcomb. She's a very insightful author who's written a very personal and compelling book about her family trying to survive and stay together while many of them went off to fight the Civil War for the Confederacy. Being a Northerner myself, a Yankee, (laughs) I don't know much about the Confederacy other than what I learned in school and saw in a few movies. So I really wanted to talk with Rita because she does such an incredible job of putting you there and showing you the world through the eyes of these individuals who lived it. So Yankee them be damned. I couldn't pass up this opportunity. Rita's a fourth generation Texan who's always been fascinated with the question of where her family came from. Her genealogy research is what led her to write A Twist of Tobacco, which is the first book in the series about her family. And her reading starts right now. Chapter 1. A Child is Born. August 1861. Watt rides. A scream tore through the black velvet night and echoed up and down the holler. The thundering hooves of a horse could be heard as 19-year-old Watt Ornby rode hell-bent for leather to fetch the doctor for his mother. His mother, Nancy Carol Winstead Ornby, was 40 and delivering her 11th child. She had promised Watt's little sister, Maddie, that this baby could be hers to take care of in place of that rag doll she wagged everywhere she went, even to the outhouse. Ironically, today was Maddie's sixth birthday, and Watt didn't want her to be disappointed. Besides, he was glad to get away and not have to listen to his mother's suffering. Though he was the oldest son and had been around for several births, he didn't remember the other babies being this much trouble. At least he was doing something to help, and it would take him the better part of an hour to get to town and at least that long to get back with the doctor. He had heard the old women at church talk about babies coming too fast and mothers and babies dying. He wasn't sure what he'd do if something bad happened to his mother, so he spurred Molly, his chestnut mare, a little harder. It hadn't rained in a few weeks, and the road was firm, but dusty. There were many cutbacks and turns due to the hills, but Watt and Molly knew this road well. They had ridden it often since he started courting 17-year-old Martha Jane Taylor, who lived just across the county line. Marthy told him just this week that her three older brothers had joined the Tennessee Volunteers in June. Her father only had 15-year-old Jim, 9-year-old Jeff, and four girls to help him on the farm. So Watt figured he'd go over and help Mr. Taylor get his tobacco in as soon as his father could spare him. He might even take his brothers to help. After all, what were neighbors for but to help each other? Watt's mind wandered to thoughts of Marthy at the most inappropriate moments. He shook his head to refocus on his mother's distress and push the mare harder, despite the road. Doc McGrew Watt reined in at Doctor's hitching post, ran up on the dark porch, and pounded on the door, yelling, Doc, it's Watt Ornby. Mama's having her baby, and Pa sent me to fetch you. Doc, Doc McGrew, open up. A sleepy doctor opened the door in his nightshirt and saw it was young Watt. Mrs. McGrew was standing behind him and invited Watt inside. 
There's some coffee left from supper. I'll warm you a cup while the doctor gets dressed and saddles his horse. Thank you, ma'am. I am powerful thirsty after the ride here, Watt replied. Shyly then added, I'd be happy to hitch up your buggy, Doc. We'll make better time on horseback, Watt, so saddle the sorrel for me, please, and then come have your coffee. Mrs. McGrew had just set a steaming cup of coffee in front of Watt when the doctor called from the front door. Come on, Watt. We better ride if we're going to help your little brother or sister into this world. The two men left, coffee forgotten. Carol, a buggy and team belonging to neighborhood planter and Marthy's father, Anderson Lafayette Taylor, was hitched to the porch railing of the Ornby farmhouse. Anderson kept Eli Craig Ornby company, while his wife, Nanny Taylor, assisted Carol in the house. The men were on the porch drinking coffee, quietly discussing the war and crops, and listening to the summer night sounds punctuated by cries coming from the house. Three of Eli's teenage sons stood a few feet away, trying not to worry about their mother. They were convinced that Watt would return with the doctor soon, and all would be well. Meanwhile, Carol's screams turned into moans and came more frequently. She seemed to be getting weaker with every tick of the clock on the parlor mantel. Eli stretched out his long legs and stood on the top step. He looked to the sky, counted his blessings, and gave thanks to the Lord for ten healthy children, a baby on the way, tobacco ripening in the fields, spring foals in the pasture, and calves fattening for market. His life was full. He took a deep breath of the sweet summer night air and motioned to the boys to stay on the porch as he went into the house. It was a solid two-pin house made from hand-hewn logs. The spaces in the oak shingle roof allowed air to circulate when the weather was dry but swelled into a watertight covering when it rained. All interior walls were whitewashed with lime and lye to control insects, and a central front door faced east and, and led to a wide hallway that was once exposed to the elements but had been closed with doors at both ends. A narrow staircase led to double lofts on the second story. In the hallway, Eli looked upward and stopped to listen as 10-year-old Lizzie tried to keep the four youngest children quiet in the loft. She could be heard singing church hymns as she tried to get them to sleep. Eli opened a door into a large bedroom, or pen, north of the hallway. It doubled as Eli and Carol's sleeping sitting room. In addition to the bed, there were several straight chairs, a rocking chair, walnut cabinet for linens, and a large desk for Eli's farm accounts. An ornately carved but well-worn cradle sat on the hearth, waiting its newest occupant. He entered the room and quietly went to Carol's side. Their oldest child, 21-year-old Polly, had come from Shelbyville to be with her mother. She was expecting her first child in a few months and was sitting on the bed holding her mother's hand. Her big blue eyes were wide with fear. Nanny Taylor was bent over Carol, wiping her face with a wet rag. Eli took his wife's hand and told her, Watt will be back with the dock soon, Carol, honey. Lizzie has the water boiling and a stack of clean rags here by the bed, along with that pretty blanket you knitted for the new baby. Is there anything I can do? Carol looked up at her husband and gently smiled through her pain. No, sweetheart. Polly and Nanny are taking good care of me. I think this baby's going to be Maddie's birthday present after all. The doctor arrives. Eli had been through this procedure ten times and thought he knew all there was to know about women and babies. But this pregnancy hadn't been an easy one, and Doc had warned Eli that there could be problems with the birth. Carol suffered with a condition many Southern women experience. Her womb had fallen from having so many children so close together. A midwife had delivered the first five children, but with Lizzie's birth in 1850 and the subsequent five, Eli had insisted on having Dr. McGrew come help her deliver. After Maddie was born in 1855, Carol's womb had never gone back where it should, and she wore a pessary belt to keep everything in place. When stubborn little Maggie decided to arrive feet first last year, Carol had extremely long, hard labor and developed what Dr. McGrew called a fistula. The infection had never quite healed, and the doctor had warned Carol not to get pregnant again. But here she was, 
15 months later, delivering another baby. Eli heard horses approaching the house. Soon, heavy footsteps announced the arrival of newcomers. Lot called out, Pa, the doc is here. The doctor entered the bedroom, took one look at Carol, and asked Eli to leave. Mrs. Taylor, would you hold the lamp closer, please? And Polly, light more candles if you can. Well, Mrs. Ormby, my dear, you insisted on having this one, so let's see what you have. The women moved out of the doctor's way and flanked him with lamps and candles as he gently lifted the quilt and went about his business. Henry is born. Screams once again tore through the holler, and soon they were followed by a baby's hearty cry. Eli, with Watt and his brothers close behind, ran into the bedroom. Five little heads peeped over the top of the loft, and ten pale eyes peered curiously. Polly, the eldest daughter, walked out into the hallway, proudly held up a bundle and beamed. Happy birthday, Maddie. We have another brother. Lizzie and Maddie groaned at the announcement of another boy, but Jack and Sam grinned and shook hands. Seventeen-year-old Ed leaned close to Watt's ear and commented dryly, I wonder what we'll name this one. The doctor was still attending to the post-birth procedures, but Carol looked up from the bed and asked him, Doc, what's your first name? The doctor mumbled, Henry. As Carol took her new son and snuggled him to her breast, she murmured, Then we will name this child Henry McGrew Oinby, in honor of the doctor who brought him into this world. Eli pounded the doctor on the back and offered him a twist of his finest tobacco. They walked out on the porch, loaded their pipes, and Polly brought them each a cup of coffee. Thank you for your work tonight, Doc. I'm not much use in these women's things, Eli reflected. Eli, I have to tell you the truth. Carol's not out of the woods. This birth took a lot from her, and I've given her some medicine to help her rest. If that infection she's been having goes any further, she may not recover. The men sat, smoked, and drank their coffee in silence, each reflecting on the warm summer night and the events of the evening. While the young children drifted back to bed, Carol could be heard singing to the new baby. Nanny Taylor came through the door and gently put her hand on her husband's shoulder, signaling it was time for them to leave. Well, thanks for joining me today, Rita. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was very interested in having you on the show because you've written about the personal accounts of your family in Tennessee during the Civil War. Now, I grew up in Washington, D.C. and also in parts of Maryland and Virginia, where not only the Civil War is memorialized, but you can still see the effects of it to this day. So I can understand what inspired you to write the story. But what compelled you to publish it as opposed to just keeping those personal accounts for your own records? Well, the genealogy was more or less handed to me by a, a cousin of my father's several years ago. And in researching it more I, the, the, and in talking to her, the story got just more fascinating. It started with an obituary I have for two of the characters. As I read these obituaries, some of the things that they said in their interviews in the 1920s and 1930s was just fascinating. So I started researching it more and more. And as I did, these people became real to me. And Virginia, the cousin who had given me the information, knew Lizzie and Watt and several of these people. She was born in 1912 and she grew up knowing these people. And so some of her accounts of their idiosyncrasies, if you will, uh, their personal traits and personality traits can be traced directly back to the war and their trials and tribulations through those years. And I got to thinking about how the things that happen to us as children or young people can really affect the people we become as adults. Absolutely. And these were some fine people, but they did have their little personality quirks, Lizzie especially. But her story was was the most traumatic. As a 10-year-old, well, actually she was 11, when she had to take responsibility for her 
for her five younger brothers and sisters, literally alone. Mm. And just think how that could affect a child of today. Can you imagine an 11-year-old? Yeah, it's not as common now as it would have been back then, especially during wartime. Exactly. And Middle Tennessee was a hotbed of activity. They were were within 18 miles of Stones River and could hear the cannons during the battle. You know, they would just tell the younger children that it was thunder, you know, or something. Yeah. It it uh, it was just a very traumatic experience for all of them that four years of the war. And, you know, take away the political aspect and and all of that. It's just they're trying to get through their lives. Yeah. And then the effects that that has on them later as they as they mature and become adults. So well, that was my goal. Well, and that's specifically what I meant as well about growing up in D.C. and how the area is still very much a reflection of the Civil War. You know, for example, yes. Maryland and Virginia are right next to each other, but the cultures mm-hmm. are completely different. Yes, <laughs> I have friends and relatives in both areas. I've been there many times. And yes, it is. So as you were researching this, I mean, these weren't just names on a page for you because you could talk to someone who knew them personally and lived with them. So that made your characters three dimensional. Well, and the fact that they are my ancestors, too. And, and in doing this, because I, I, I didn't know them, they all died before I was born. But I could liken them a lot to my own uncles and aunts mm-hmm. and family members. So it really it, it really helped me to give these people personalities. I really like what you did with the intro, how you're introducing the individual people, because, you know, as you alluded to, they are going to have a significant part within the overall story, within the overall series. And plus, when you read about the Civil War, you know, it's it's more the historical accounts. It's more the facts and the maps and the battles. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't really get the personal accounts of the people who actually experienced it and what they had to do to survive. And I really like that the story is told from a very conversational way. In fact, was that difficult for you to do? Just imagining what that dialogue would have been? Yes and no. Sometimes it's difficult to get started. And there's a lot of it that has to be exposition, just because it is, you know, you've got to get the information out there. And I cover some battles, but I try to use the same technique rather than I go on and on about how many men are lined up shooting each other. I, you know, I try to do it a conversation between uh, a couple of the, the characters, you know, after the shooting's over or before it starts. I try to put it on a personal level. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I thought it was interesting that you were able to to pull those names, and those facts and kind of relate them to your your current family members. Mm-hmm. When, exactly. Right before I left D.C., I was able to trace my family back to the 1820s. And what surprised me was that a lot of my current personality traits and even some of my interests <laughs> can be traced back to them. Yes. Well, and, and physical traits also. Yeah. You know, I, I've been to Tennessee several times doing research, looking at places. I even know where they actually lived. I finally found that one out. I've uh, been to the cemeteries, you know, been to the battlegrounds. Yeah. Uh, but on one of my first trips, I had met via the Internet a distant cousin. OK, I think he would be like a third cousin twice removed or something like that. And my husband and I arranged to meet them in a JoJo's or something, some restaurant. Walked in. It's like, I swear, my husband and I both turned and looked at each other. They're sat. Two of my uncles. <laughs> I mean, spitting image. Mm. You know, we just kind of look. I got, I got chills just now thinking about it. Mm. Still, it, it was just the strangest thing because they were like five generations removed. And and that's it. Seems that's what you're able to use to put yourself back into that time. So it isn't a stretch yes. for you to write about it. Now, your story introduces a uh, ten-year-old Lizzie. Is she an intricate part of the story, or is she one of many characters? Well, she is one of many characters. 
Of course, starting this out and listening to all the experts about I need a main character and maybe a second main character and a nemesis. And it, so, yes, in this sense, Watt and Lizzie are the catalysts that, that bring everything together. We're going to put it that way. But the family is the story. It's mm-hmm. a story about family and how they stick together. And the family closeness and unity is is the story. That's the main character. Okay, and that makes a lot of sense that you're making the Civil War this big, overwhelming, epic theme, personal and easy to understand. Yeah. Well, that's a, the the nemesis. The nemesis is the war. It was brother against brother. Yeah. The Civil War is is a scar that we still bear to this day. I think it changed the face of warfare during that time. You didn't see carnage and you didn't see, you know, just human suffering on that level before. And I mean, you're talking about the Napoleonic Wars overseas. You're talking about. I mean, literally, it was brother against brother. And in this family, it was brother against brother. Now, now all of Watts, Watts' two brothers went to the Confederacy with him, okay? Mm -hmm. But Eli, Eli had two brothers who who fought on opposite sides? And oh man! One went, and you see this a lot in families of that era, especially in Kentucky, uh, Missouri, those states. Mm-hmm. You know, but because they, and they were at the same battles mm-hmm. a couple of times. Anyway, I have one of them say, "Well, I'm sure glad I didn't have to kill you." You know, at the mm-hmm. battle, and the other one says, "Yeah, I'm glad." Uh, I didn't have to kill you. Dad was already mad enough at me for going to the other side. <laughs> <You know? laughs> One of uh, Eli's sisters was married to a Yankee. And I mean, mm. they were married when the war started and he went to the North. Has writing this book given you a new perspective about the Civil War in general or about the events going on today? Uh, yes and no. Mm. Not so much about the war because I've always been open minded, of course, raised in the South. And um, I'm, I'm 68, I'll tell you that. And so, so no, it has not really changed my mind any on it. I just think it was a tragedy. And I am proud of my Southern heritage. I think that they fought for something they believed in. I do not, do not, and you will never convince me that it was always about slavery. That was a very minimal part of it. That was an institution that was already dying and probably would have, I know not fast enough for the people who were there, you know, it it, it was already on its death throes. It had nothing to do with it. It was purely states' rights, which, yes, that's what we're battling now, and federal control. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's a political uh, uh, nut we don't want to open, I don't think, on this, Mm. but... You know, and, and, and I mean, I'm for the union, and it is the great, still the greatest country in the world. But there are things that I just believe that states have the right to do that the federal government doesn't have any right to do. <sighs> okay, I'll use the interstate highway system as an example. That's mm. a good, safe one, okay? Okay. Uh, well, they, they tell the states how to build roads and where to build roads, et cetera, so that they can connect with the other state and it becomes a federal entity, right? Right. Okay. So look at the bureaucracy and the funds it requires to fund that entity. Okay. But the states aren't controlling anything, but they're the ones that that are sending the money to the federal government to pay bureaucrats to function in this entity. And we've given them that that power, that right. It it runs over into schools, Medicaid, you name it. The federal government's in control instead of the states. I I, I got you. (laughs) With me living in Virginia and growing up, I I get it. And to a extent, I even agree um, that states do need to have more control over what they can do for their own residents. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it's what the what the residents want. Like I said, the interstate highway system is is the classic example, though. You mm-hmm. know, but they started it. See, with the railroads, the states had no say mm-hmm. over what the railroad system did, and this is the same thing that was happening during the Civil War. Mm-hmm. It was economic. I mean, the South was rural. Okay, North used that stuff 
to make stuff. I'm sounding like George Carlin, but it's the <laughs> truth. So the North says, oh, well, let's just go grow our own stuff or we won't buy it. It's too high. So then the South's sitting here with dead cotton or whatever and mm -hmm. mouths to feed, okay? Because it requires people to pick that cotton, whether they be your own children or mm -hmm the other thing that we don't talk about too much. So, so the North says, well, we'll just put you out of business and then you'll have to give it to us at our price. So it, it was economic anyway. Okay. Enough on that. That gets <laughs> tedious after a while, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, but it's very fascinating. It's very fascinating. So the only other question I had for you, a twist of tobacco is the first of three books. What are your goals for the series? Where do you see this going? Well, to, book one is about the Civil War years, literally from from 61 to 65 mm -hmm. and ends when when the war is over, more or less. Then book two is uh, called A Vow Unbroken. And it's when the men come home, everything in theory gets back to normal. If you can consider Re Reconstruction Tennessee normal, the farm is ruined. uh there, there's just nothing there, but they try and they struggle. And so book two is all about the reconstruction years from 1865 to uh, 1882 or so mm. when they decide to move to Texas. Then book three wraps it up. It covers a longer period of time. So in 82, they start to finalize all the moves. It takes them quite a while to move everybody to Texas and uh, what actually moves. And this is when it starts book three and it carries them through until 1930. So we cover quite a bit of territory, but we go through World War One, the invention of the airplane, electric light, the, the automobile, yeah. well, just everything. And my grandfather, which was Watts' grandson, was uh, born in 1885. You know, think about the things that, that were invented and that happened that he saw in his lifetime. And when he courted my grandmother, he'd pick her up in his buggy, you mm. know, and they'd go on a picnic mm. <laughs> or go to church. You think about that. Yeah, yeah. And then you put it, it in perspective as, you know, even the changes within your own lifetime, how... Oh, yeah. I mean, computers have, gosh... Yeah. You know, that's that's my biggie is the, the electronics age. So, great. Where can readers find you and your stories online? Well, I'm on Amazon, on Kindle, Books A Million, uh, Barnes & Noble, eBay, and, uh, of course, my own website, my publishing website, which is www.fountainspringpublishing.com. And you can get a signed copy there. And the one thing I do ask would please leave a review, an yes. honest review, yes. good, bad, or otherwise, on either Amazon and or on Goodreads. And I, I'm I'm doing what I can for signings and bookstores and festivals and everything else these days. So. I've done the Sons of the Confederate Veterans Convention. Mm. I am a member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, mm. and I do those meetings. I do programs with them occasionally. So, uh, you know, just look for me online. Okay, awesome. awesome. Just Google a twist of tobacco and you'll find something. <laughs> Okay, great. It was a pleasure having you on. Great conversation. Well, it was a pleasure being here, and I do appreciate you inviting me. And with that, we'll wrap up another episode. Man, I'm really glad I talked with Rita. It's so important to learn as much as we can about our shared history. And I think personalizing the story the way that she did is a great way to keep the conversations going and be able to relate it to what you may be going through in your own life. Or even to gain a new perspective into what's currently going on in the country right now. And as always, if you have a question or a comment about this episode or any of them, let me know. Connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, or send an email to info at ch1podcast.com. Till next time.